when you see someone who is um, who's white who's defending that privilege, that is actually how they see. It. I mean, they see themselves losing something, and to a certain extent, you have to accept the fact that they are. But what they're yeah. losing is an unfair advantage that was gained through, you know, all the wonderful things we always talk about: colonialism, you know, genocide, slavery, pillage. Like that's that's what gained your advantage. Welcome to BetBeat Media. Uh, we're here with my friend Asal Rad, calling in from California. Uh, Asal is a researcher at uh, NIAC. Did I, well, actually, what is your title there? Senior Research Fellow. Asal is a Senior Research Fellow at uh, NIAC. The, uh, uh, oh shit. Okay, National I'm not going to read that one. American Council, is that it? There you go. National. National Iranian American Council. Ah, okay. So <laughs> Asal Rad is a senior researcher at the National Ameri Iranian American Council. Uh, happy to have her here. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Exciting to see you. Uh, exciting to see anybody here, but, um, <laughs> but would prefer it not to be via Zoom. Uh, you guys are both in Hong Kong? Yes. So um, we are both... Uh, working as a professor at the Department of uh, Global Political Economy at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, we saw that uh, you had a, your PhD in what was it? Middle Eastern studies. Can you tell us exactly? Uh, it's really Middle Eastern, like modern Middle Eastern history. It's so funny when you tell people you're a historian because they'll start asking about any period, any place <laughs> in the world. Um, and I'm like, that's kind of infinite information. So we, we tend to focus on fields and not just anything that happened at any given time in human history. So uh, mostly focused on contemporary Middle East and my research is focused on contemporary Iran, uh, especially post-revolutionary Iran. Um, so I wanted essentially like a historical background, a historical backdrop to understanding uh, the current state of affairs and history. I'm actually, I was a psych and cognitive science major in, in undergrad. Um, but I got very interested in Middle Eastern studies courses. And this is because I went to undergrad, you know, right when I started undergrad, when the second Intifada was happening in Palestine. A year later, you had 9-11, you know, one year after that, not even one year after that, uh, several months later, the invasion of Afghanistan, and the year after that, the invasion of Iraq. So like, you know, my undergraduate experience really formed around these events. And that's why I got interested in those courses. And to my mind, and a lot of political science majors are going to get upset, or international relations majors are going to get upset when I say this, but to my mind, history was uh, the most holistic way of understanding actually where we are today. Like it was less of an academic endeavor and more of trying to really get at how did we end up where we ended up. And it's a shame that it is one of the subjects that is least liked to, for people to study or understand because. Kind of important to know. Hold on, hold on. Are you trying to say that you can be get a better understanding of how the world works today by looking at history than by finding some uh, data set that's available somewhere and running some multiple regression analyses on it? Really? Wow, that's hard to understand. It's fine because I know that you are disdain for the social sciences, and so it's I can say this is a safe space for me, so I can say this thing. No, I mean, not disdain. It's it's love. <laughs> Every discipline offers um, its own, you know, it, it, its own analysis and, and contributes to the overall study. For me, it was just, it was hard to understand still why we're in this current state without all that background. And it always became, you know, it becomes sort of a, like, where, where do you start type of a thing. So when I say I study contemporary uh, Middle East, I still had to study you know, the entirety of the history of Islam. And then that always went back to, well, you should probably understand Christianity. And then, well, you got to understand Judaism and how, you know, so it was, it becomes this study of understanding every layer of how you got to where you are. But what was the meme you once sent me, Peter? It was something like um, people who study history are 
people who study history are, are doomed to watch those who don't study repeat it something like yeah that. exactly or exactly and yes yeah. that's how it works mm. yeah 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 i like that and it makes a lot of sense it's it's a bit of it's the same critique that I have of, of, of social psychology. That's my, my background. So it's pretty, pretty similar to you. And, uh, and, and I don't know uh, if, uh, well, probably not, but recently, I, well, less than a year ago, maybe around a year ago, I published a paper in uh, Perspectives on Psychological Science on how our, our science makes a, makes a very big mistake by uh, really ignoring like, like larger social historical contexts of society when trying to explain behavior so we we run a we run a data set you know of some behavior and we say oh this person behaves like that that person behaves like that without ever questioning the large deeper sociological reasons behind where does that behavior actually come from you know that's such a big problem of our social sciences well that and you know so again if you look at this context that uh we sort of came of age in um a lot of it had to do with the war on terror and so there's tons of research on the notion of terrorism. Why, why, do, why, why are there terrorists, right? Like there is so much research and literature on it. One of the problems is, is exactly what you're saying is if you, it's then easy to draw conclusions that don't necessarily uh, reflect this larger history. And so people will jump to a conclusion saying, oh, well, I guess Islam is just a, a religion of violence. And it's like, well, it was around for 1400 years though. So remember all of that time before you don't see the same phenomenon and that's why it becomes so um, reductionist to just take these, you know, take a small space and just understand the phenomenon there. I still think that that is important in our overall understanding. But like I said, it's it's the more sort of the more disciplines, and this is why, like in in contemporary academia, multidisciplinary appro approaches are yes. are gaining traction because that's the only way to really understand it, you know. And it's like instead of sort of competing to see who is who is right it's more like well if there's a problem and we're all trying to sort of find the same resolution to it then it's contributing and cooperating um into how we can we can study that thing and and funny enough you can use that exact logic for the entire global community and how we do things yeah but yeah. but i think they're you're you're kind of downplaying the importance of uh having a data set where you have a dichotomous variable of muslim or not and then you have a freedom score that's that's numeric and then you look for a correlation and if you find one like well you know islam causes on freedom exactly and that is the problem with our sciences is that and 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 probably you can relate to that as well is that in a way by not questioning these things it's purely it's purely supporting the status quo and that's why we often call this a hegemonic science. It's a Western hegemonic science. We don't question these deeper intentions behind, for example, the conflicts in the Middle East. You know, uh, we just uh, study, OK, there's more terrorism or, uh, centered uh, or organized in these areas in the Middle East uh, compared to terrorism uh, anywhere else. And we say, you see, the ter ter tendency of, 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 of Muslims uh, in that part of the world is uh, is is. Uh, um, more strongly skewed towards terrorism than anywhere else while nobody ever asked like okay but what happened the decades or hundreds of years before that that it's such a mess or a chaos over there you know and by not questioning these things it's just simply you 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 indirectly really so are supporting the status quo and to just get back to what you just said as well is that i had the same frustration like 9 11 was for me a kind of a wake up call before that life was just idealistic and, 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 and good. And I didn't really care about all these intergroup relations, but with a uh, father from Algeria, of course, and nine 11 happening, things just, my whole reality changed, you know, like how, how, how people spoke of people that come from my father's uh, country, uh, uh, and how people speak about Muslims and so forth. Um, and what, what I saw is that, what you exactly say, and the same happened in the Netherlands, I think the same happened all over the West, is that all these, like, the things that happened in the Middle East was all explained away in, uh, with reasons such as, okay, but Islam is against our freedom. These people are inherently dogmatic, and they attack us because uh, they hate our freedoms, which is so ridiculous if you, if you at least know, you know, some other human beings from, from maybe any Muslim country, 
and, and, and that just triggered me so much until today, you know, until today, we're still having that discussion. You know, what do you think about that? There's, I mean, there's, okay, so there's so many assumptions that go into that, right? Um, Indonesia is a Muslim country, it's the biggest Muslim country in the world. Malaysia is a Muslim country. You're never talking about those countries when you're talking about Muslim countries. I mean, there's one and a half billion Muslims in the world, right? So to take that many people and try to categorize them and, and sort of paint them with one brush is obviously uh, problematic from its outset. But there's also, I mean, you're raising the question of the academy itself, right? Like we're all scholars, whatnot. Um, and we've been through that process. And that's why actually people who have been through that process are the ones who are supposed to be questioning its integrity the most, right? And in the same way that a journalist should be questioning the integrity of another journalist. Like right. we are, you should be holding your peers more accountable than other people holding your peers accountable. And, and the reason is because there's an entire history. I mean, you're pointing to the fact that social sciences uh, or you know, even, even what we considered biological sciences at one point historically um, were created to justify uh, racism, right? Like we like forget that part of that history. Science was used, uh, scholarship was used to justify slavery. Science and, and all these things were used to justify these differentiations that we created in society. If you look at the work of Edward Said in Orientalism, that was his entire point. He said, look, Orientalism was a study to maintain colonialism. If you look at the work of, I believe it's Max Weinreich who did um, a study just a few years after the Holocaust and looked at, and his study is called Hitler's Professors. And what is the point of that? It's to say that Nazi Germany wasn't just, wasn't just a political uh, structure through like a bureaucracy, but was actually supported through, again, the academy. So the same, we ask questions today about there's, there's people getting dissertations, getting PhDs, talking about the question of terrorism, the question of Islam. Well, there were people getting PhDs back in you know the 1930s in Germany on the, quest the Jewish question. And so we just assume that in the present period that we exist in, everything is now pure and we're doing everything great. You know, like one of the phrases I hate more than anything is when people say post-colonial. I'm like, when, when, did, <laughs> when did it end? Yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah, right. Like it didn't end for we, us to be in a post-colonial era. Um, so these are the things that we should be challenging within the academy. It, and I remember when I had students, that was the main thing. It was like, don't listen to what I'm saying because I'm saying it. Don't listen to what your professors are saying. Examine it yourself. And through that examination, right. figure out, you know, where, where there's room for you to actually draw conclusions and formulate your own sort of opinions on it. The problem is there's a sort of laziness in, that's not fair. Maybe I shouldn't say laziness because obviously we do this as a profession. Um, but there's a while we have access to so much information the problem is is we don't have access to how to interpret that information we just have a bunch of information right like i can explain schrodinger's cat to you because i can google it and read a wikipedia article about it it doesn't mean i understand physics it doesn't mean i understand the math it doesn't really mean i understand what i'm saying i can just repeat it to you so there is a difference between having access to information and being able to digest that information and make sense of it. And that's the part that we're uh, missing, I think. I think it's somewhat similar to what you were saying before about people asking you, you know, tell me about Mesopotamian history or tell me about uh, the, the history of uh, the human colonization of the Americas uh, 10,000 years ago. You know, they, it, it's a similar sort of thing. And in the realm of history is so large, uh, you could spend the rest of your life studying as much as you could and never get anywhere near 1% of all knowledge out there. Well, that's what people face when they're, when they're facing the political world. They have access to unprecedented amounts of information, but how do you choose what information to delve into? And then when you have that, that, that ignorance, uh, then your interpretation of the rest of the world can get as absurd as you know, we, we see a lot uh, already in the real world. So you know, whether you're talking about you know, is, is uh, uh, Islam, does Islam just inherently produce terrorism? Well, if you don't know any history and you're just looking at the world and the only pieces of information you have are, oh, I see on the news all the time, uh, Muslim terrorists. Oh, okay, well then it makes sense. I, there seems to be some sort of link there if you know nothing else. It works the same with, with economic policy. You'll see people say like, oh, you know, look at Cuba. Uh, you know, the, the US is so rich and free and wonderful, but Cuba is uh, not as rich. So it must be their economic system that's inferior, as if there's no such thing as, as history that, that put Cuba into a, a, a given state of economic development 
And the US is at a very different state of economic development. Its relationships with the rest of the world, its claims on resources were totally different. So ignorance can, can really produce some uh, amazing opinions, like they hate us for our freedom. That, that's, right. that's the but, perfect example. But you would also see that the ignorance, of course, serves a function because the ignorance often is, um, is, is advantageous to those who hold power. And I'm not only talking about political power, I'm also talking about those who have run this show in academia. And then suddenly people like me, who has a Dutch mom and an Algerian dad, or people like Assaw, who's an Iranian American, come into the academia and they start to like, like really, really question the fundamentals of all these assumptions that these uh, our, our uh, how can you say that, academic ancestors uh, had, you know what I mean? I also think that that really plays a role. It's, it's the, the, uh, the di diversification of, and I'm going to say this, ethnic Americans, or sorry, uh, uh, indigenous Americans and indigenous Europeans. And why I'm saying indigenous? I'm saying people who are right now born on the soil of the United States or born on the soil of the Netherlands or any other Western country, who are, who have a diverse background ethnically, but who are from those countries, you know? And these really start to question all these assumptions that seem so normal in our, our countries and our academia, because it was so homogenous before. You know what I mean? What do you think about that, Asal? Uh, I definitely think that, yeah, when you have people uh, who, look, so history and, and all these disciplines were, dominated by the people who were dominating at the time, right? So who was that? White men. That's just the reality of the situation. Right. Um, so once you actually, and so when they're studying the Orient, when they're studying, you know, countries um, across Asia, across Africa, when they're studying women, when they're studying anything, um, they're doing it from their own vantage point. And when suddenly there's an influx of those actual people studying themselves, it becomes a, a little bit different because the way that they see it is a little bit different, right? Um, yes. You don't see it through the lens of your own domination. In fact, you see it the opposite, right? You see it through the lens of um, your own uh, repression, right? Like your own persecution, your own having been colonized, having lost uh, something within like the fabric of your being through this experience. And that that is the opposite approach. And so that it often has challenged the mainstream narratives. And so absolutely, yeah, you see, um, and you have seen historically like backlash where you have sort of academic um, debates and really like personal feuds because, you know, if anything that, you know, messes with the status quo um, will bother the people who benefit from that status quo. That's essentially yeah. what it always is, right? Like the, the really, like the origin of the idea of being conservative is to literally conserve things the way that they are. And you only do that when it benefits you to do so. But when it doesn't, you want to naturally change it. So it's funny, you know, in these, in these discussions about like white privilege in the United States, um, you know, there's always these arguments about things like, like reverse racism. And it's like, well, well, that can't exist because you would have yeah. to convert the entire system of race and create a different dominant class and make white people inferior in that new structure in order for there to actually be such a thing as reverse racism. And what they don't realize is if they think that they're giving up something, they are. But what they're giving up is an advantage, the privilege. They're not, they're not becoming less equal now. They're just having to be actually equal versus having an advantage the entire time. And, and trying to explain that difference is, is challenging because on one hand, when you see someone who is um, who's white who's defending that privilege, that is actually how they see. It. I mean, they see themselves losing something. And to a certain extent, you have to accept the fact that they are. But what they're yeah. losing is an unfair advantage that was gained through, you know, all the wonderful things we always talk about: colonialism, you know, genocide, slavery, pillage. Like that's that's what gained your advantage, um, not just ingenuity of your minds and that that's the problem again when you only have a historical perspective that goes so far back you know everybody has everybody can pick their own starting point mm -hmm. when they were at the peak of civilization it's like well i'm going to start it this year you know even even history even time all of it is a construct like why we exist in the year that we exist is a construct and these are the things that i think 
um, from like a very broad public position, it's more difficult for people to, again, digest and understand because we are so stuck in our present moment and understanding the society around us as just, this is what's normal because this is the only thing that we've experienced. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 your words are, are like, like almost you're, you're answering the things that are in my brain, I love it. Uh, I don't know, Peter, you want to say something? Yeah, it just reminded me of uh, something Paulo Freire said about the, the reaction of the former oppressor when the oppressed gain a little bit of, of equality or gain a little bit of power. He has, I, I wish I could remember the whole line, but it's something like, you know, in the past, you could go to a concert hall and hear Mozart. You could go and, and buy airplane tickets and travel around the world. Uh, you could have a maid at home. But now that those people you know, some of them are able to go to college, some of them are able to hear Mozart, some of them are able to, to travel. That doesn't feel like other people losing their chains, it feels like you being chained. So the, the reaction among the, 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 in the minds of the, of the formerly dominant uh, tends to see the, the decrease in their relative power, which is, which is real, like relatively speaking, their power is lower to the people that they used to utterly dominate. They interpret that as oppression, and you can see that all over the world. Right. right. That's exactly you, what it is. They interpret just having someone have not even equal, right? Not even equal, but just less dominance over another group as oppression. And and that's why it's so frustrating when you know you hear those debates occur in, in not just in domestically in the U.S. but the U.S. Uh, you know vis-a-vis -vis sort of any foreign entity. I'll give you a concrete example. The U.S. yesterday bombed Iraq and Syria, and they called it self-defense. Now, here's the problem with that premise. It assumes that the U.S. presence in Syria and in Iraq is inherently okay, right? right. There's, no, there's no questioning to that. You don't, nobody can question that. Like, we're just allowed to be there because, well, we're the U.S. Yeah. So there's no, you know, the, the very basic rationality of you cannot be defending yourself on the other side of the planet you, when you are actually an occupying force on that, on that side of the planet. There's no such thing as self-defense. But we, this is how, this is the logic that works out. And it's the same, it's the same cognitive sort of dissonance. It's the same mental cause that allows you to assume these inherent clearly biases that advantage you. Nonetheless, I think we should be very concerned about Chinese aggression against uh, U.S. Uh, warships in the South China Sea. I think there's right. some self-defense needed there. But I well, think this is also about the Iranian ships that were sailing across the Atlantic, right? right. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah, it might be going to Venezuela. It was uh, exactly right. So as soon as they entered the hemisphere, it was a threat to the U.S. But you know, U.S. boats, ships. Uh, military warcraft in uh, in the Persian Gulf again, just normal. Okay. Well, I, I think I think you you, you touched on, on some very good points there, and I think don't forget when for five hundred years you can tell others what to do and how to think, and you are never wrong. You know how deeply that is ingrained into our Western cultures. Like I always look at it from a more European lens and more Dutch lens, and it, which was a which was a horrible colonial power that most people seem to ignore because we're such a small little country. But for almost hundred years, they were as bad as Britain, dominating the world with horrible, horrible colonialism. And um, and what I see, what I really notice, is this total lack of introspection when it comes to things that are happening. To such an extent, like you say, when you see something happening in the Middle East, you see bombing over and over of countries completely destroying thousands of years of heritage continuously by the West. And yet people are just unable, you know, in, in my country, probably large swaths in your country, unable to see why why are these people angry why are some of them attacking us you know it's this total sense of innocence that deep sense of western innocence while murdering thousands of people you know and it's just baffling to me it's very hard to understand this, this total inability 
to put yourself into someone else's shoes. Well, I, I, I think the process of dehumanization plays a significant role in that, right? The, the, exactly the conversation we were just having about this like notion of terrorism. Like it is not, people do this all the time. If you look at the way uh, US media covers Israel-Palestine, if you look at the way that US media covers um, domestic terrorism versus foreign terrorism. I mean, this has repeatedly been said. The biggest terrorist threat in the United States is white supremacists. This is a fact from the FBI, from Homeland Security. It's indisputable. But no one even considers it that way, right? Nobody thinks about it that way because we have been trained through not only our politicians, our politics, but through media and not only news media, but also just like how much it's inundated in our culture, right? The yes. fact that this seeps through to every part of our culture. I mean, I'm Iranian American. I was born and raised in the US. But when, I mean, when you are of a, a different heritage, you, you pick it up when people are talking about that country of heritage, right? So when Iran is talked about, when Iranians are talked about in the media or um, in like popular culture, obviously I'm honed in on it in a different way than someone who is not of Iranian heritage, right? Because I'm sensitive to it. Cause I always think like, oh, they're talking about me. Right. And I have so many just unbelievable examples of insane racism against Iranians, right? Like one of the classics that I always use because it's, I feel like if it happened now, there might be some kind of reaction to it. But in the, in the show, in the series Friends, right? Like this very run of the mill, like everybody's heard of this show, everybody's seen it, probably the most popular television show in history. There's a line in the show where um, Monica's boyfriend is uh, training to be a UFC fighter. And she comes out and she says, hey, the, the person he's about to fight trained in Iran by ripping the arms off of thieves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's not even a blip. It's just, and there's, I mean, the, the number of examples that exist that are similarly, it's, I just use that one because it's, it's friends, right? It's like this mm -hmm. very friendly, obviously show. And here is if any other group had been implicated in that comment, there would be backlash, but there's none. Like that didn't happen in the 1990s in the United States. No one cared if you said something like that about Iranians. So this process, when you're constantly vilifying someone, I mean, even the way that right now, if, as soon as in, in US media and when politicians want to make something seem nefarious, they just at, attach the word Iran backed and suddenly it's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We should be scared because they're Iran backed. It's, yeah. and, it, and it takes away the agency of the people they're talking about, whether they're the Iraqis, whether they're Syrians, whether they're. Yeah. Many's right. It's like nobody has agency. Apparently, Iran is now dominating the entire region. Even it, not, e not even just the region. Venezuela, like Iran, is often brought up in in the context of Venezuela. Like they're they're spreading their tentacles in South America. But this is exactly also what 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 uh, uh, Edward Said talked about. Eh? The power of, mm -hmm. of language and Orientalist language, in the sense that uh, I think the same effect you have with Hamas. Just throw in the word Hamas and people are triggered by that scary Arab word and thinking about Hollywood movies and evil terrorists. And, and you immediately won the debate. Oh, Hamas is, Hamas is behind these attacks. Oh, we should support Israel. You know, totally ignoring the fact that Hamas is a resistance movement, movement of an occupied, colonized people. You know what yeah. I mean? And totally ignoring the fact that the Israeli government supported Hamas in its uh, fight against the PLO. Which that's almost never brought up at all. That's the innocence. Hamas was created in like 1987. And so when they talk about the problem is Hamas, what about 1940, 1948 until 1987, right? It's like, it's, again, it's, it's these words, these catchphrases, these talking points that get picked up and they get repeated so, so often, so often that even if, especially, in fact, if you're a passive listener, right? If you're not entrenched in this information, if you're not studying right. it, trying to examine it, then then all you're hearing is this information in passing. Yeah. And if that's all you're hearing, then once to your point, you know, once you hear it in the media, you're triggered by it. It's like, oh yeah, I, I, I've heard that it's bad. And that's about it. That's about all the information that that individual might know um, about this. Yeah. Yeah. Very good point. And, uh, and that is also why I, why I, 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 I really often critique psychological science in my teachings and, and my articles. And where, where I say that racism is, is not situated in the mind of the person. Racism is situated in the context that shapes the mind of the person. You know what I mean? You can have, like, uh, you probably heard the debates on anti-bias trainings or whatever. 
you can have anti-bias training, whatever you want, but if you put on the televisions and there's demonization going on of Iran and Middle Easterners, and you, you go onto the streets and, 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 and the lowest paid jobs are being done by immigrants, you can anti-bias training all you want. It shapes, it shapes the way you see the world, you know, and, and media plays an exceptionally powerful role uh, in that whole, uh, in this whole, uh, in, in this affair, you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm absolutely. Yeah. No, no, go I'm ahead. curious to see what where you think. I, I think there's something. There's this uh, a book by Joan Robinson I read recently, and she she said something like, uh, you know, when when you're faced with a obviously intellectually unsatisfying idea that nonetheless is very widespread, there must be a psychological explanation for that. So I'm curious, what 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 do you think explains the? It seems to me disproportionate. Uh, animosity towards Iran in the kind of foreign policy set, the blob, so to speak, in the United States. Uh, it seems like it's it's out of proportion to the the uh, the power in terms of economic and military and political power, or even soft power that Iran has. Uh, is do you think that it's it's just as simple as you know so many people uh, were. Uh, they really believed that the Shah was was going to be their, you know, gendarme in the region forever, and Iran was, you know, their client state, and they would remain so forever. And then the revolution happens, and some of their friends in the CIA get killed, and then they just have a personal grudge. Or what? What do you think explains the the what seems to me? And you can contest the framing too if you don't think it's disproportionate to Iran's power. But what do you think explains that? Oh, disproportionate. I mean, I mean, in in converse, it's sort of fascinating in um, the the framing of the debate when it, when it comes to Iran. Um, it It's made to seem as if somehow Iran is a threat to the United States and nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, no one is a threat to the United States. First of all, there's that reality, right? Like, let's just be honest and face the reality that there is no comparable power to the United States in the world. It's the lone superpower of the world. Iran specifically, I mean, here's the simplest reason why the, the, proportion, the proportion makes no sense. Iran is currently being crushed under US sanctions. If they had proportionate power, they could retaliate. They can't. That's the reality of it, right? They can't, they, can't, they can't retaliate sanctions in kind and do anything to harm the US economy. They have no power to do so. And so the idea that these two states can be compared in any way is, is ludicrous on its face. So there's a couple of things that I, I would think go into this sort of broad vilification. Number one, and it's not the revolution itself, because if you look at the revolution, uh, the revolution happens in February of 1979. And diplomatic relations with Iran are not cut until November 1979. And that's because there's still an embassy in, there's still a, there was still a US embassy in Iran and obviously what happens in November of 1979 is the embassy seizure by Iranian students, right? And what does this coincide with, the history that it coincides with? Uh, about two weeks earlier, in October of 1979, uh, President Carter at that time let the Shah into the United States. Now in 1953, the United States and uh, the UK carried out a coup from the US embassy, right? That was where the coup was carried out. That's, the, that's how they had the ability to do so. Um, that overthrew Prime Minister Mossadegh and reinstated Shah, who was a dictator. Repressed people, this is obvious, this is something that's, you know, this is, these are historical facts that, funny enough, now people try to somehow counter as if the U.S. itself has not admitted its role in the 1953 coup. So, but let's set that aside. So when the embassy seizure happens, I mean, that is really a moment of humiliation for the United States. It's just one of the realities on the ground, right? It's just, it was what 444 days of terrible images of host US hostages taken, uh, blindfolded, their hands tied behind their backs. It was that sort of sin on the Iranian part. It's something that has never, ever been played down. Now, of course, the reason I mentioned the history is because we never contextualize the fact that that was a direct reaction to our own sin, right? Like there are mutual grievances. It doesn't excuse the, the seizure of an embassy, but neither does it excuse right, carrying out a coup. So there are mutual grievances. That is, I mean, that played so much into the American psyche of Iran. I'll give you another popular culture example. Um, I was like, you know, a young teen playing the game Taboo, which is, you know, a game where 
you pick up a card, there's a word on it, and there's a series of words you can't use um, and get your team to guess it. And I flipped the card and the word was hostage. And one of the words listed was Iran. <laughs> and of course, teenage me, I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah. Okay. That's how deeply ingrained this becomes is that it actually, I mean, to be in a mundane game like taboo, you have to imagine how much this is played out. Now, do we think that that history is over? No. In January of 2020, when after President Trump uh, basically okayed the assassination of Iran's general Qasem Soleimani, and they went back and forth with this sort of like bellicose rhetoric, what was the one of the first things that Trump said? I'm going to target 52 cultural sites in Iran yeah, for each yeah. in 1979. That was 40 years later. So that moment is something that I think stays in the American psyche. Um, and it's because it's been played up in all sorts of popular culture. There are, there are Saturday Night Live skits about the embassy seizure. That's the extent to which this has played into um, the, like US culture. So, so to, uh, to quick, quickly jump in there, then imagine, imagine the, 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 the images of, of blindfolded uh, uh, Muslims in Guantanamo Bay, how long that will stick into the future. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So they're, they're certainly powerful images. Now, yeah. there's a second thing that I would add as to why the US position is as sort of like staunch as it is. Um, I have made the argument that there's sort of a dual pillars to US foreign policy. One is to be, one is to constantly play up the threat of Iran as a menace, and the other is to be staunchly pro-Israel. And those are actually directly connected. Because one of the, uh, not, and when I'm talking about these societies, whether it's Israel, the United States, or Iran, obviously, as a caveat, none of them are monolithic societies, they're not monolithic governments, but predominantly the way the states behave is what we're talking about. So in the state of Israel, especially under someone like uh, Netanyahu, who has been you know, a central figure in contemporary Israel, Iran is always the threat that's used, right? It's always, well, you know, we have to have whatever we have because Iran is an existential threat to Israel. There's this really great clip of uh, British-Israeli historian Avi Shlaim, where he goes through and compares uh, Iran, and the, Iran and Israel to each other. And he argues that while Iran is a strategic threat to Israel, Israel is an existential threat to Iran. He flips it, right? But having that threat, I mean, you see how often it plays into it, right? When uh, just recently in these last bombings of Gaza, when Netanyahu was still prime minister, uh, Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State Blinken, went to Israel. Uh, Netanyahu and Blinken had a press conference. And, you know, Netanyahu basically thanked the U.S. for its unconditional yeah. support and then immediately started talking about Iran yeah. as if Israel had not committed war crimes, as if they hadn't just killed 200 people, 60 children, as if, you know, there wasn't clear uh, footage and evidence of Israeli violence against um, Palestinians in East Jerusalem and Sheikh Jarrah, like as if none of that matter, Iran was the first thing, like was basically, thank you, now let's talk about Iran. And so yeah. it's, it's the, you know, it's what's always used. And so these two things sort of play together. You have to support Israel no matter what it does because it has a neighbor in the region, which is Iran, which is an existential threat to its existence. And we have to care about that existence. And oh yeah, Iran is also really bad. And so almost everything you see framed, even when we're engaging in diplomacy with Iran, we have to still say, we, but they're really bad. Like you have to start with that. They're really, really bad, but we just don't want them to have a nuclear weapon. Again, yeah. it's just reducing an entire society to these um, black and white dichotomies. Yeah, and it's the same, and the opposite is being done with Israel, of course. They're really good. You always start with they're really good, you know, mm -hmm. like every time the question is being asked about Israel, if one of the first sentences, at least U.S. politicians will say, well, first of all, I, I support the, the, the Israel's right to, uh, to defend itself. Or I'm a, some of them will even say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Zionist in the U.K. Also, politicians say I'm a Zionist in the Netherlands as well. It's, it's this every time Israel comes up, the politicians just need to like stumble over each other to to be the one who is like the most pro-Israel. And, 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 and you see the opposite going on with the, with Middle Eastern countries. And in this case, especially Iran, that, that you always have to start with some something negative, you know, like like what you say, black versus white. 
and it's this double standard that is so incredibly frustrating you know what i mean and and that that taps a bit into the discussion we had before this double standard was something the west got away with for a long long time you know the sense of innocence but also their partners and you see now that this is start to be questioned by people like you people like peter people like myself other people like richard methurst online you know or the fred hampton leftists so you see what I just said, eh? that you see a new generation start to like pull these foundations. Uh, how do you say that in English? Start to tremble those foundations, you know, uh, of, of that, that whole system of, of Western innocence. And I, I include Israel in there. And then the evil, evil brown people in the Middle East. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I, in, it's in these conversations, you sort of get stuck in a situation where then it sounds like you're taking someone's side and I'm not, right? Like, it, am I saying Iran's behavior is not problematic? Of course not, of course it is. Uh, more so towards its own people than anyone else. Like that's, that should be the major concern that uh, most states have is how they, they treat their own uh, citizens. And so that's not, that's not the question. And in fact, that again, that's, that points to the, how problematic the framing is, right? If you want to criticize one, it's as if you're endorsing the other, and that's not what's happening. It's very easy, actually, to just say across the board, you all suck. Like, this is a criticism that goes across the board. Right. Um, because in reality, these are all states that have uh, a certain group of people who are in power and who care more about maintaining their own hold on power than they do not only their own citizens, but anybody in the world, right? Like, mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't matter, for instance, for the United States, if its sanctions kill people. It doesn't matter for the United States if its bombs are killing people. What matters is maintaining its hegemony and its control over the world. And we just use flowery language like we're doing it for freedom or we're doing it now, apparently, um, in self-defense. We're, we're in the Middle East in, in self-defense, attacking mm -hmm. countries that never attacked us. Right. And you even have whole uh, academic disciplines or theories within whole academic disciplines like international relations that essentially give sanction to whatever, you know, the, the most atrocious government behavior, mass murder, mass murder through uh, bombing, mass murder through sanctions, whatever, uh, because it's it's situated in a story that says that uh, the, the world system is by its nature so fallen. It has such a, a Christian Puritan uh, kind of tinge to it. The world is so fallen and sinful, uh, they use anarchic, uh, that every state just to ensure its survival has to act like the biggest rat bastard possible or else a bigger rat bastard could exterminate you. So morality just doesn't come into play at all. You're committing a category error if you try to bring moral thinking into international relations. You need to think solely in power terms and try to maximize your power. And so when you have people thinking like that, and, and they actually think that that is an accurate description of reality, well, that, that can sanction any behavior, as long as it maximizes state power. <laughs> Something that I've, I've thought about a lot uh, lately in like trying, because, you know, I went from uh, being at a university uh, and into sort of uh, a, an advocacy group that's based in Washington, DC, and becoming much more familiar with what they call the Washington Beltway, right? Um, I love, by the way, the lingo that, I mean, we academics do the same thing. Like we all have our own sort of vernaculars that we use, but that transition has been very, very interesting because there's there are two completely different worlds. Uh, one in which you sort of, to, to a certain extent, at least, I mean, we can be critical of academia, but at least you're engaging in some kind of critical debate um, versus this, which is just talking points, right? It's like a series of bullet points that you just hear repeated and someone else repeats their own talking points and that's all it is. And so I keep thinking about the problem with the conversation, right? The problem with the conversation from its framing is that we're never talking about like what our actual philosophical outlooks are, right? Like what is, if you inherently see human beings as competitive, like that's it, like that's their dominant nature. Obviously they're both cooperative and competitive, but if you see and understand human beings as inherently predominantly competitive, then the world in which we exist makes sense to you, but also we're not saying it that way, right? So what frustrates me is if you believe in US empire, just say it. Like that's, that's an argument to be had. We can debate about, you know, I don't agree, but at least then we're having a real conversation versus when someone tells me, I just wanna bring freedom to the world. I'm like, yeah, that's not, okay, that's clearly not what we're doing. 
So if you want to have US empire because, and I've heard people make, very rarely, but like make this argument, well, if there's going to be a hegemonic power, shouldn't it be the US? Which should be, yeah. there's always gonna be a hegemonic power, so it may as well be the US. And so then you can actually get into some kind of conversation. The problem is the conversations tend to be flat because they're just these talking points. Like you're not really having the conversation. I would argue that human beings are more predominantly cooperative. And that's why you see, you know, the United States, yes, we have all the wonderful tech companies. We also have, you know, mass suicide rates, uh, drug overdoses. We're the most heavily, I think, um, prescribed like antidepressants in the world. It's like, well, there's something amiss in, in the way that psychologically we're dealing with the world around us. Life and expectancy just dropped those, by two years, by the way. Wait, what happened? Life expectancy in the US just dropped by two years. I did not know that, wow. Well, I think that this is, this is interesting what you're saying. And I think that this is a debate I also often have with my students. And that is that human nature is highly complex dependent. So if you, if you grow up in a very collaborative kind of environment, think about uh, indigenous groups in, in the Amazon, uh, Amazonia, for example, you, if, 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 that is, if that is all your the experiences your brain had, you become a very collaborative being. But if you grow up in a neoliberal political economy where everything is competition and being the best and, and self-entrepreneurship and that kind of stuff, you become highly competitive. And where does this kind of thinking come from? Well, it's with hundreds of years of, of, of European expansionist cultural development, you know, that, that shaped the capitalist system that we have, that shaped the religion that was also highly focused on expansion and domination. And it shaped a very competitive world. And that's the same and when people talk about that, 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 that terrible, in my opinion, paper by Samuel Huntington, on the mm. clash, clash between civilizations. And I discussed it with my students. Some of my students thought it was so great. And then I was like, yeah, but it is one kind of perception. It's seeing the world in continuous competition with each other. It's this typical Western black and white thinking, racialized thinking of enemies, good guys, bad guys. And, and it's, it's a continuous struggle for dominance. That's why it's always about national interests, always about power, always about um, um, dominance. It's it's instead of words, it's like uh, we just said collaboration, harmony. You know things that are way more normal in the cultural development of China, for example, where harmony, uh, uh, um, communalism, all these things are are more deeply embedded into into the culture. So so um, yeah, I really think that it's just super context dependent how we turn out as human beings. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I mean, I do, I certainly agree with that. Uh, I just think that there are things, even though it's context driven, but we are also an incredibly unhappy society. So something has to start Definitely. to explain, right? Like if we, you know, um, my wife is Finnish and she uh, grew up in Finland. And Finland is a country that has, I think in like, the happiness index, uh, the number one several times, right? Why isn't it the US? Like, why is the US not the happy? If we have, we have the most money, we have the most resources, we have the best tech companies, you know, we have, we have everything. So right. then what is the issue? And so there is, I mean, at a certain point when you're just looking at society and the way that exists, there's a disconnect. So if it's to your point, if, but if it's only context driven, then we should be happy in that context, but we're not like, we're still not happy. So there, right. there's, something missing in the discussion. There's something missing in the equation that, that focuses sort of always on the surface, but never really asks these questions. Then if we're the greatest country in the world, then we should be the happiest and we are not. And so I feel like that's a question that somebody, should, every American should be asking themselves every day. Why is that? Yeah, and, and, and even, even the, the World Happiness Index, I, 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 I have my doubts because the Netherlands is also always in the top, top five, six, seven, and sometimes number one, two, three. Um, and still you see that psychological issues of depression and, and anxiety are tremendous problems in Western Europe as well. You know, like, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a, it's, it's not only the U S I think it's, it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's a problem of, of, very industrialized societies, you know, whether it's capitalist industrialized societies, whether it's Japan, 
Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, Finland. Uh, United States is probably one of the worst. I, I admit that it's, it's a very, very individualist competitive society. We have a little bit of a social democratic buffer, so to speak. I think that plays a huge role. Um, well, there's, yeah. there's less stress, right? That's, there's, there's another Definitely. study. Um, there's, I forgot one, it was from a few years ago. But uh, essentially the point was, are people with kids happier or are people without kids happier? And they realized that that was context driven. It's not, you know, it depends on what country you live in. In the United States, people without kids are happier. In countries like Finland, people with kids are happier because it's stressful if you live in the US, right? Like it's just, it adds so much stress to your daily life. You know, how are you going to care for this human being? Like our, our uh, notion of work and earning and safety nets, none of those things exist. And so there are other qualities that exist within the country that then create those sort of like triggering stressors and, and explain like, cause like happiness obviously is such a sort of ridiculous index, like the, that descriptor um, mm -hmm. is, is so broad and vague, it's hard to say, but I think essentially those are the things that they've taken into account when looking at the notion of happiness. People basically, you know, having or not having stress. I mean, the work yeah. culture in the US is just, you know, you don't feel, even if you have time off, you don't feel like you can take it. Well, Hong Kong is Hong Kong is also one of the world's most notorious <laughs> uh, places to work. But uh, yeah, yeah, and we've got Hell Joseon over there, Hell Korea, as they as the younger generation calls it, uh, for the same reasons. But my my sister studies a lot of these comparative happiness studies. She knows them very well, and you know there there are certainly issues with she's measuring Finland, happiness. Yeah, she's in Finland. She's a Finnish citizen now, by the way. Um, so she, she knows very well, like how they're, they're measured. And, you know, I had a lot of, uh, doubts and I was skeptical at, at first, but I, through looking at the, the various means by which they measure happiness, I think they're, they're really attaching on something real there. What I joke with her all the time is, is that I think it's, it's the, the strongest statement you could make in favor of the kind of mild social democracy that exists in the, in the Scandinavian countries today, that those countries are still ranked among the happiest even though their weather is god awful, half the year is, is pitch black, mm -hmm. only suitable for vampires. But nonetheless, because of their, their you know, basic social democratic programs that, that reduce stress and create a little bit more equality than we see in, in the US, uh, it, it, it overwhelms that. So that's the, the, the best uh, advertisement or, or, or compliment, I guess, I could give to and that set of policies. And still, I want to, to make a bit of a counter noise because there's something I've always been bothered by a lot in, in many Western discussions, and that is this, this fetishization of Scandinavian countries, which is seriously sometimes sickening me because like I'm sure I'm checking the happiness, uh, World Happiness Index 2021 right now. And indeed, Finland, Denmark, Switzerland, Iceland, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Luxembourg. So that's the area uh, where I grew up and, and, and I, I I, that's why <laughs> that's why I'm also even that's why I'm also more critical, I guess. But first of all, Scandinavian countries are are pretty much similar to Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, France. So it's not a Scandinavian thing; it's a Western European thing in general. France is a bit more neoliberal, I must say. But um, not just that. So a friend of mine is Swedish. He's half Swedish, half Pakistani. I am a Dutch, half Dutch, half Algerian. And I wonder if you start studying the happiness index and you start controlling for race or or ethnicity. I'm not talking about Finland. Finland is Finland is so disconnected uh, for us as Europeans. We never talk about Finland. It's very weird. Like Finland, Finland somehow doesn't exist in in the whole narrative of our our uh, area. Even though the, <laughs> the Netherlands. Yeah, keep your voice down, Graham. <laughs> Looking around. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, no. But I think it's I think it's actually a good thing, you know, like to be be more isolated from all these these, these stupid Europeans. But um, <laughs> it's it's very strange how, how Finland just always is out of the, the discussion, which for me makes it a way more interesting uh, country. So I cannot say too much about Finland, but I I wonder if you would control for for ethnicity for these happiness studies. Because in Europe, we tend to always like focus on, on the, the, the autochthonous majority white population. Uh, I think you'll get a very different story. Let me give you uh, an example. 
countries like Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands are notorious, notorious for the for the blatant racism that has become normalized in our public debate. Like if you open the newspapers in Denmark or the Netherlands, you see literal words like more testosterone bombs are coming into the country. We're talking about mainstream media. We're talking about politicians who say we have to clean our biggest cities clean because 40% is non-white. These are things that are normal in our societies for the past 20 years, especially the Netherlands and Denmark are notorious for this stuff. But Germany is catching up. Belgium is already bad. UK is catching up with the far right running the show. So for me, I always feel that these studies always, which has been normal for so many decades, for so many years, just ignores one group of people for whom the, the, the country isn't that beautiful. You know what I mean? It's the same with the whole human rights debate. Uh, let's pull it international. The US is always talking about the rule-based order and human rights debate. I would say human rights for who? Human rights for white people, yes. Human rights for white people may be under threat when you talk about China or whatever, or at least that's your feeling. It's probably not the case. But the rest of the non-white world has never felt your human rights, you hypocrite. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm, I'm going a bit on a rant here, but I, I hope you, you, you get what I mean, uh, Asal. No, absolutely. I, I, I mean, there's no, you, you cannot deny the, the factor of being a disenfranchised group existing in a culture or in a place where there is a superior group, right? So that's, that, that should be included um, in any kind of study that is looking at these. And, and I'm sure to your point, you'll find differentiation between different groups. I think from my mind, I was thinking more in terms of, you know, I mean, even right now when we're talking about all of these sort of movements to the right, more xenophobia, more uh, right-wing governments that are being um, elected, in some cases selected in the world. Um, I, I think it's hard to remove that from just mass inequality. Right, like one of one of the things that moves people to the different poles is when the center is failing them. Right, mm -hmm. so and the center is failing most people. Right, most people are struggling, and we talk about um, this idea that we've like ri raised so many people out of poverty. We're also shoving them back into it. Right, like that that is also happening. Um, so I mean, the the extent of that part of the debate was more what I had in mind when I was thinking of those specific states. That doesn't remove the, the question of racism in those states, which is to your point, and even, even in a country like this, um, which is probably more homogenous than other countries. Nonetheless, even in that country, there are groups and people who exhibit like racist ideologies. But, yeah. you know, again, I think when you have mass inequality, that's where the scapegoats come from. Right? That's how it's easy to blame immigrants. That's why it's easy to blame minorities um, because really people are frustrated by that failure of the center. And that's why you see these movements to the right and the left really. And Absolutely. I mean, I hate to bring up history again, but we're basically just repeating a hundred years ago. Oh, definitely. Right? Yeah. 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 Saw the rise of fascism. We saw it in, um, in opposition to the fact that there was mass wealth inequality. I mean, all of these things came from, I mean, even in the United States. So I use the examples of Scandinavian countries and to your point, it's a bit of a cliche to use those. I actually always say, why don't we just use the United States as its own example? So, you know, no one's ever, the, the catchphrase was always the American dream. And the American dream is the American middle class. The American dream is not being Jeff Bezos, right? The American dream was you know, you have a job, you can send your kids to college, you can buy a house, you can own a car, you can have like the basic um, luxuries or necessities, whatever you want to talk about in a household. That was being mm -hmm. middle class. That came about because of the progressive movement at the turn of the century in the early 20th century. That's where the middle class came from. Populism, like, that's we built as it used it. to be called. Right? Populism, as it used to be called. Right, but that, that's what created those changes and, and the root of it. I mean, there was different, when you look at the progressive movement in the US historically, it wasn't this like unified thing that they called themselves progressives. It was different groups that had their own reasons to, to call for change, essentially. That's what it was. Again, the center was failing. What was supposed to be the system was failing and it required some kind of change. So it's interesting that we don't use the US as an example to itself. I mean, all of the progress that we made that created that idea of the American dream 
was basically undone over the last 40 years. And so now that's why you're seeing these sort of uh, ideologies and disparities and, and really challenges to the system is because the system is failing people again. Yeah. And, and to bring it uh, to psychology for a second, like what you said uh, about the, the, the growing inequality, creating space for far right movements to, to gain adherence. Uh, intergroup bias comprises in-group bias, where we feel favorably towards people of our own groups, and out-group bias, where we, we, we treat people who are not members of our groups disfavorably or unfavorably. But in-group bias tends to be much stronger than out-group bias, except in uh, uh, situations of perceived competition. Yep. What do you get when you have a, a vastly unequal society? You have much greater, more salient uh, competition. And then also to your point about repeating history, you know, that, that bothered me so much uh, when you know, all the, 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 the liberals and the US mainstream media were talking about orange Hitler and we're, we're repeating uh, 1930s Germany, et cetera. Well, yeah, that, that's a good thing to talk about, but what they never talked about was uh, how Hitler was aided by the kind of centrists of the day, the economic liberals of the day who didn't want to change the economic system. They were happy with the economic system as it was. And so that gave space for a, 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 a you know, bolt out of the blue, like the, the Nazi party to gain adherence because they were promising something that would radically revise that system. So, you know- that's, was, that's a Godwin, Peter, that's a Godwin. Uh-huh. Godwin, yeah. you know? So, so that's, that's the way to stifle the debate. Don't mention the Nazis because that's a Godwin. So we are not oh. allowed to learn, you get it? You were not allowed to learn from the past because that's in the Netherlands. When we talk about how we see the same kind of parallels, even the cartoons that we are using eh, well, to demonize uh, Muslims uh, is almost identical to the cartoons that were used to, to demonize Jews, for example. And also how, how uh, liberalism in, in those days, it was still called liberalism, was completely deconstructing uh, the state. And after the First World War, of course, the, the Germans had nothing left, which created the, the opening for, for fascism, you know? And you see that now with neoliberalism completely destroying the welfare state, it's happening in slow motion in my part of the world. It's incomparable to the, to the crap you guys have to go through, but it's, it's comparable. And if you say like, hey, wait a minute, and that's what Richard Wolff does, for example, this is very comparable to what happened in the, in the, in the 30s before, uh, before uh, Nazi Germany became a, a really uh, big issue for the world. Then, then in, in the Netherlands, at least, you would hear like, oh, that's a God win, that's a God win, and, 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 and bam, the de debate is over. You know what I mean? It's same as like, oh, you're pulling the race card. Just say some term and, and the debate is over. We can keep the debate into the in the United States. That's why I always say it. I'm like, you don't you don't need those examples. We we have our own examples, we have our own history, and we are simply reverting back to a way that the country was before we made changes. Forgetting everything else, forgetting every like global aspect to it or anything like that. The fact remains that we are watching the middle class in this country also be you know slowly is shrinking it's shrinking over time right. i mean you have 40 million americans that live in in poverty that's not a small number that's a pretty big chunk of the population to be living in poverty and so yeah. you know the, again like there's all these um criticisms of millennials like oh millennials aren't buying houses so they're ruining the economy well they can't afford houses it's not that they don't want houses we do we just can't afford them <laughs> Yeah. So it's these, you know, you, you end up in these situations where we're not actually looking at, you know, it's like, oh, the U.S. has gained so much wealth. Yes, it has, but it's, it's consistently concentrated. And the pandemic, I think, if anything, was sort of a way of showing us all of these different phenomena in almost a, a hyper concentrated context, because you saw exactly that problem. Right. We actually we gained a lot of wealth, but it all went to, you know, like 10 people not literally 10 people, but, you know, a small group of billionaires. Well, you're not far well off. Over, yeah. yeah. Not, far, not off, far off. Yeah. Made well over a trillion dollars while, you know, 20 million Americans were unemployed. Uh, I think the, the evictions will likely start in the U S in basically this week. Yeah. So we've, we've put off the, the economic fallout of, of what we've actually been through. We've been able to sort of put it off, but it, it, will likely hit eventually and it's going to hurt 
of millions of people in this country. And again, so it's like, we can, we don't have to go outside. We don't have to look at other scenarios. We don't have to look at other, we can just use the United States as its own example. And I think that's, at least in my opinion, that's the most powerful argument that you can make because I don't even see what the, what the problem is at that point. Because people always say, well, you can't talk about Scandinavian countries, they're homogenous, the US is diverse, the US is this. It's always something that makes it, the US is too big, you can't compare it. And it's like, well, okay, compare it to itself. Yeah, well, no, they're pretty diverse, Scandinavian countries. Yeah. Uh, so that's, oh, yeah. that's just a bunch of, a bunch of crap. That's just it's, the counter argument that's always used. Yeah. yeah. Those would, are homogenous societies, this is a diverse society. Right. My favorite one is they're small, we're big. And they bring that up in the in the context of healthcare, like, oh, they can do a, a healthcare system that works just like the entire rest of the world can, uh, industrialized world can, uh, but we're big, so we can't do that. It's like, okay, then split it up state by state. Like whatever size you need, like do that. It's yeah. just such an yeah. idiotic argument. But it, re it remains it, weird, of yeah. course, that you have a society that has the money to continuously buy bombs and weapons just without any any end in sight we're talking about what was it 700 800 billion dollars for uh, it's military about spending two billion dollars a day how much two billion dollars a day two billion dollars a day a and day. can you can you imagine just if you would take five days of those probably you could already instate a very good health care system you know like a, a health insurance system you know, like a public health insurance system you would see in other countries. It's just it's just complete nonsense. If you can pay that amount of money on bombs and weapons, you know, how easy is it to just pay that a, a small amount of that that big budget and, and, and spend it on, on your people? Uh, we're still spending billions to, ad to advance more nuclear weapons. Like that's what we're spending billions of dollars on. While while we're trying supposedly to denuclearize the world because of the realization that obviously if, if there is ever nuclear warfare, it would um, be catastrophic to our species, we're still building, we're still spending billions of dollars for even newer uh, nuclear weapons. So it's, yeah. it's, I mean, it's not, it's not based in any kind of real logic. Right, it's no. not a logical argument, and that is that, and that's the dissonance, right? It just, and when you hear the arguments, it's so frustrating. I mean, even yesterday there were, there was a clip. I forgot who it was, but it was on, I think, like MSNBC or one of these like mainstream media channels, where somebody said, "Oh God, you know, when we talk about defunding the military, our enemies." Oh, yeah. are do. Oh. Like, yes, yes, yes. Oh my God, and you know, this is, I think, this is. Very scary, and I understand Noam Chomsky's focusing on nuclear weapons all the time. Don't forget, there's one one country that has used them, those nukes, and it's not been a long time ago, and that's the United States. And the United States is just like, uh, to make a weird parallel, it's like a madman just building nuclear weapons, building, building, want to send them into space. It's, it's to go completely insane, you could say, you know? And I think, we should seriously consider the idea that, that the United States is going to use them again when it's losing its, its grip on the world, you know, especially when you have some lunatic uh, ruling, uh, ruling the country. I mean, yeah, Trump, but there are probably <laughs> way worse guys who are actually smart and, and, and sick in the mind, psychopaths, who will yeah. just drop the bomb. Very simple. You know what I mean? Speaking of, no, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. I, I was going to uh, use that, uh, that as a segue into uh, one of the questions uh, uh, Ukraine had, had, had were thinking about. Uh, and you can jump in here if I'm, if I'm not, you know, giving the, the question it's due, but something along the lines of, you know, okay, we have this, this kind of unipolar uh, hegemonic system right now with the U.S. empire dominating, but there are little signs here and there of the potential of a multipolar system uh, kind of sprouting out of the, the, the current system. Uh, what do you think the, the uh, possibilities are of uh, countries that would, or, or governments of countries that would very much like to not be under the empire's boot? What are the, the chances of them uh, uh, uniting in some fashion, organizing in some fashion to really forge a, a multipolar system? Like, not just Iran, not just China, not just Russia, maybe even the EU, maybe even South American countries, African countries. 
what, what, what is your opinion about the, the prospects for that sort of development? Well, I, I like to always say that I am cautiously or hopefully optimistic um, that, that, is, <laughs> that that is the direction we'll go in because, okay, quite simply, uh, this is one of the most frustrating things too, is that we talk about a rules-based order. We talk about this international system that the U.S. helped create. And that's the reality of it, right? The U.S. helped create the, the U.N. in the wake of World War II. Um, and we love talking about it, but it makes no sense because we don't do any of the things that we actually say, right? What, what basically ends up happening is the international community or uh, the United Nations or any other international body are just tools of imperialism themselves. They're used when they're useful to us and they're ignored when they're not useful to us. Mm -hmm. And so in order to genuinely reach, you know, like, like, like I said earlier, I'm like the idea of post-colonial is such a ridiculous phrase. Like we're not in a post-colonial world. We still exist in imperialism. Imperialism did not end because the United States is an empire. And so that rules-based order that we talk about um, should be what we're striving for. That 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 should be the goal of where we get. Um, and you know, the U.S. just like any other group of people uh, is very unlikely to relinquish its own power. Although I say that in 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 terms of the U.S. population, in terms of Americans themselves, I don't know if you can say that that's the case, right? Americans themselves, oh. when they're polled, um, don't necessarily believe in the wars we conduct, and they don't necessarily want to be an imperial power. So I don't think that what our country does, what our government does is a reflection of the majority view of Americans. I would argue that's the opposite. So in fact, Americans themselves, we play a role, right? So someone like me, the reason I'm so vocal is for that exact reason. We have a responsibility as the country that is an empire, as the country that is, you know, indiscriminately bombs whatever country we, we, we want. Like we have a responsibility, especially if we believe in the idea that we're a democracy, because then it's a it's our government. It's you know of the people for the people by the people. Like that's not just a catchphrase. If that is meaningful in any way, then we have a responsibility in, in how our government acts. But it will you know I do think it would require not only uh, some kind of social movement within the U.S. that holds our government accountable, starting with accountable to its own people, right? Like challenging the idea that we should be spending two billion dollars a day on war when 40 million people live in poverty, it's just starting with that. And then also seeing a counter movement internationally where, yes, I mean, it, it finally comes to a point where it's like, well, this cannot go on in this fashion. Now, the most likely scenario will simply be changing the economic balance by changing the, the world's reliance on the dollar, right? It shouldn't be done through military, because that's the opposite, right? Like even if the international community decides, okay, we have to check the power of the US empire, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't try to check it militarily because that defies the entire purpose of what you're actually trying to do. There should be some kind of resolution where there's sort of reckoning for the US to, to finally be the country it claims to be, right? To be the country that is a, a world leader that um, wants to maintain uh, a world order rather than be an empire. But the realization has to be, for every American at least, that those two things cannot exist at the same time. One right, has to right. yeah. You either have to give up the idea of the international community and just decide that we, you know, it's still the age of empires, or you have to give up empire. But both cannot exist simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, that's a big, I think that is also the danger of having one, one world leader or a, a police officer. That's the one with tremendous power. And, and you've seen it, it's in human nature. The moment we have unchecked power, we inevitably corrupt as human beings. You know, it's it's just something that all the time happens. I saw a great speech from Chris Hedges yesterday about how power on unchecked always, always corrupts us, always. And um, and he he has a very good point there. Uh, so in that sense, I think yeah, what you would see in the old days with the bipolar world of Russia and America, well, I, I think that was actually not a bad thing, you know, like keeping an eye on each other and uh, make sure that uh, that not one is, is getting all the, the power as we, we see right now. It's just, it's, it's like I say it as a foreigner, you guys are American, I say it as a foreigner. Uh, uh, for, for us, the United States is completely out of control. This is an extremely scary country, you know, it shapes 
literally everything that happens around us in the world, even 9-11. 9-11 changed all of our lives, you know? Like literally individuals in any freaking country, their lives is being influenced by the political decisions and of course the actions your country does. So I understand that the rest of the world would say, yeah, America is the biggest threat to the world peace. And why? Not just because Americans are inherently evil and other countries are not, but because unchecked power of one nation is something the future really needs to avoid in some way, shape or form. Or hopefully we will have someday have a future without nation states and competition between territories and that kind of stuff. I, I don't think that'll be possible until we, you know, it's like a stage. We have to get through empires first. And we have, yeah. right? Like, and, and it's great to sort of idealize this idea of like a borderless world and, and the idea of declining nation states, but nation states are not declining. Right, where they're very, the nation state identity is uh, arguably still the strongest sort of like central identity that, that orders the way that we communicate and operate with each other. And so right. I think the first step is to actually do what we say we did, um, which is eliminate empires. Uh, yeah. You know, and, that, and that's what I mean. I, I think that the idea of say like the United Nations is great. It's a great idea. Um, I would start by removing the concept of permanent members and permanent veto rights because that inherently gives more power again to a set of nations. And so as long as we're, you know, as long as we're not, as long as there's no equity, I mean, I, it sounds like a cliche, but as long as there's no equity, we're going to continue to have these sort of um, competitive situations. And I don't mean equity in the sense that every human being in society and every country in the world has exactly the same thing. That, that's incredibly unlikely to happen. But like gross inequity is also not a viable solution to, uh, especially to the problems that we will face as a species, the one that we're currently living through, which is climate change. I mean, there's just no, uh, the, the fact that we are not taking it more seriously is an egregious miscalculation of our society. Yeah, 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 definitely. And I think also uh, climate change and the idea of nation states uh, and war and empire, I think in the end, it also comes down to the whole, our whole system of, of capitalism, which is purely run on, on competition and continuous growth. It, it destroys our world and it shapes the way we behave towards each other. So. I, I think as long as we don't have an alternative also to how we deal with it, this system that is so much part of the way we think and the way we are, we're not going to solve it. I, I mean, this, this is turning grim because it's, it's feeling not hopeful at all. And, and I, I don't believe that. I don't think that. I do think that there are, you know, just what we just talked about, which is Americans don't think this. Americans don't necessarily want their country to be an empire that spends $2 billion a day on the war. In fact, they don't want that, right? So it's, there is agency among people who change the conversation. And no matter how much people in power try to resist that change, um, it's, it's, you know, change is the only constant. It's inevitable. It's something that people through their own agency will bring to pass. And so you see at the very least, now the system isn't changing. On the ground, everything is staying the same. But I've always believed that the story and the conversation has to change first. And it is changing, right? You can't expect policies to change. Like no one is going to, like we said from the beginning, no one's going to acquiesce their uh, advantages, give up their advantages when nobody is demanding that they do so. But that conversation is changing. And that's why now every president has to come and say things like end endless wars. None of them do it but at least they're saying it because they know they have to, right? They know that it's like one of the only bipartisan actual issues that exists in this country is across the board, Republican, conservative, Democrat, liberal, almost everybody, they're against war. They're sick, they're exhausted from war. And so I think that's the starting point. The starting point is having the conversations. The starting point is changing the conversation and then when that can actually be adopted into policy. I mean, a lot of the conversations we're having today in Congress, like you hear members of Congress, the things that they're saying were unthinkable 10 years ago, unthinkable. When you saw uh, the recent escalation by Israel in Gaza and bombing Gaza, the fact that lawmakers in the US lined up to criticize Israel was unprecedented. So conversations are changing. 
And that's my way of being optimistic is that's why we have to continue having them. I, I was staying mum because I, I rarely have a, a, an optimistic thing to say, but uh, I was, I was just, yeah, me too. <laughs> I was just thinking that I, I read something. You guys brought and, yeah. <laughs> I read something uh, again by by Mao, where you, you know, in the middle of the 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 war, the civil war, I think he said something like, uh, "All under heaven is chaos. The situation is excellent," and he, he means like you know, if you want to really change uh, society, then having a chaotic situation is actually the best thing for you, because it's very hard to change a stable, static status quo. But if that status quo is in the process of disintegration, then the prospects for change are, are greater. So I would, I would echo your point about the, the, the different conversations people are having. I think that's largely a, a media effect, the fact that we now have access, people at least have access to uh, alternative perspectives that they would never have had access to before back in the days of newspapers, TVs, and TV and radio. That's one little positive thing. And you know, the, this really doesn't sound like a positive because we're not moving anywhere near as fast as we need to move to avoid ecological catastrophe. But as, as the, the, our ecology gets more and more damaged and you know, we have worse storms, more flooding, droughts, et cetera, et cetera, the, the chaos that that creates could potentially break up the old status quo to the extent that people like us, the younger generation with different ideas might be able to to take power and and then you know we'd have to clean up their mess and we're dealing with a complex system here the earth system is you know it, it's not linear we can't just kind of reverse things and go right back to the ecology we used to have but hopefully we won't go down the venus earth uh route and and you know live in a completely uninhabitable planet but perhaps that 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 added element of, of chaos and disruption might be an opening for uh, the creation of a more equal, just society. But don't worry, the billionaires will make it. They're going to Mars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, 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 and what, what, what you're saying, Peter, is also something that scares me a bit. And, and there was a, someone wrote a book about it once. I don't know the name anymore, but about that humans in all, across history never really changed drastically unless some tremendous disaster happened, whether it was the Second World War, First World War, uh, flooding in China. And you see the same, for example, with coronavirus. I mean, the, the, it's running out of hand in front of our eyes. And yet we're still discussing wavering patents because apparently the disaster is not bad enough. Seriously, we, have, we, we need tens of millions of people to die so it's, uh, it needs to keep mutating, 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 until tens of millions of people will die and real, realize, okay, we got to hurry up, otherwise we're extinct. And that's when people start to change. It's the same after Second World War, you know, then suddenly you've got all these new, new, more left, left uh, wind through Europe, for example. And I'm scared that that is still the case. I mean, coronavirus gives me that feeling. You know, I, I, I think it's ridiculous that the global South is still tr struggling tremendously because it's going gonna, it's gonna to bite us in the ass. It's going to mutate and it's going to bite us in the ass. And the same with, like, for example, the United States. You see a change of rhetoric. I agree as all. I think that's very, very good. But then I still think it stays on the level of rhetoric. I also see that with the squad, for example, it stays on the level of rhetoric. But what the hell is changing? I mean, blacks are still being shot on the streets. Bombs are being thrown on the Middle East. Like, what is changing, you know? Like, I still feel like we need some kind of disaster before something changes. I think that's sort of fair, right? My, my optimism can only go so far um, because the reality of it is there's a psychology behind it again, right? Like, the, the, there is, um, if you, like, as an individual, if you don't sense, you know, sort of urgency, and we see that in the way that we treat our own health, right? If you can see an injury, with your own eyes, then you immediately get treatment for it. But if you're injuring yourself with things like with substances that you know harm you, but you don't see it, you don't see the consequences, psychologically, it's much, much easier to do it, right? So if like your face turned black when you smoked, right? From like, if your skin started to like patch up, if it started to dry off and fall, the people will do it a lot less, but that's happening to your lungs. Mm -hmm. and to care, right? So there's a, there's a psychology behind it. Um, and I do think that, but I, I sort of think we're getting to that moment, right? Where we're, 
And I hope it doesn't have to go so far that you actually have to see you know, hundreds of millions of people suffer under climate change for there to be um, more action to do something. But we're also, you know, we're, we're already hitting these points and we're seeing these catastrophes. So hopefully that is enough itself to galvanize people to act. Right. And I see that we, we've taken already a, a lot of your time. So I, I want to uh, at least ask one more question that I found very interesting. I hope you will allow me to, uh, Asal. Sure, go ahead. So uh, recently I saw on a video uh, from uh, Richard Methurst, but today I saw Jimmy Dore actually uh, spending some attention on it. And that is that uh, the Iranian uh, press TV has been thrown off the dot-com web by the US. So it has been seized by the, what was it, FBI? And um, this, this touches on an extremely important aspect of international relations, okay? That the West has a, we could say, a psych, we, do, we just discussed it, the West has a kind of psychological control over the minds of global citizens through a Western controlled media system. And think about YouTube, Facebook, Hollywood, all the servers in the US uh, that are, being used by countries all around the world. So information critical of the West is systematically suppressed through algorithms or simply completely er erased like we just saw with uh, press TV. So I wonder what do you think is the future for people such as yourself, such as Peter, such as me, who really wish to see a counter narrative against the pro-Western uh, media narratives that we, uh, we receive? Do, what, what do you think is, is a way out? I mean, there's always, people always find a way to, to share information, right? And that's what I meant when I said, even before we had these technologies, um, people found a way to share information. Um, people, I mean, hundreds of years ago, when you wanted to affect change, people would use pamphlets, right? Like the written word. They were, so there's always, there's always a method behind getting around these things, right? And I say that as someone who is, has, some familiarity with Iran. I mean, Iran is a country that is um, controls, basically tries to censor everything, right? Can, tries to control the, the, the actual like websites and, and the internet that people can, can access in the country. And they always figure out a way around it, right? Like yeah. it's, it almost, every time I would travel to Iran, it was almost like a, a joke to them. It's not a joke, mind you. That's not what I'm saying at all. It is, it's a very serious situation in a country where they try to, uh, control the information that people have access to. My point is to say that I think people find a way. In the case of the US and the seizure of those websites, I think what's really problematic about it is, again, it's another, it's another area that relates to the entire world that the US controls, right? If, if the US controls dot coms, I mean, the entire world is using dot coms. So it is a dangerous precedent. It has nothing to do with the, the content that, because the claim that was made was that those websites were spreading disinformation. I, I actually read a piece, um, I think it was today or yesterday, that was saying that one of, at least one of the sites that they shut down, because I think it was like 33 sites, at least yeah. one of the sites was actually an opposition group to the government in Iran, right? So it's like, you're not, you're not even, this is not even being done with any sort of like accuracy in and of itself. But they just have scary talking. Orientalist names, probably. And yeah, like, like, oh, that sounds, that sounds bad. We're going to shut that one down, too. Yeah, yeah. It has Iran in it, so just get rid of it. Yeah. Um, but the, the problem also with the disinformation argument is we're full of disinformation. I mean, U.S. platforms, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, are full, full of disinformation, Dan yeah. wildly dangerous disinformation. Yeah. Um, and what are we doing to combat that? So the problem, again, to, to me, when I look at that situation, I, I remain hopeful in the sense that people will always find a way to disseminate information, especially when they're being blocked, especially when they know they're, at, they're actually being censored. But in the meantime, when you look at this particular situation, I think it sets a dangerous precedent, both for the amount of control that the United States exerts over global information and the fact that, again, yeah. there's inconsistency, right? Our biggest problem with almost everything is that there's inconsistency in the way that we address it. I don't have a problem with someone saying, with our government saying, we're going to do something to combat this information because it's dangerous. Great. Well, why don't we start with right here? Why don't we start with the disinformation that 
leads to Americans believing that our election was stolen and that leads to riots on the Capitol building, right? Like there is tons of disinformation that happens in this country. Um, and so we need to focus like everything else, right? When we talk about human rights, human rights are incredibly important, but why don't we focus on our own human rights abuses, mm -hmm. right? It's focusing on yourself and where you actually have a lot more control to exert rather than using these as tools for our own dominance yet again. And that that's where the problem comes in. Yeah, if, if, the, Christ, if the US were a Christian country, they might recall the words of Jesus that before you try to take a splinter out of your neighbor's eye, you might first want to take the plank out of your own eye. You know, pretty good. Well, that, was, that was before Jesus turned white. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was in Scandinavian Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's Scandinavian Jesus. I wonder how many Americans know what language Jesus spoke. <laughs> like, I'm always curious about that. Even so, what, if, what, I mean, langu what, 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 what language did he speak? Aramaic? Yeah, I think Aramaic. so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was Aramaic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember that guy in the United States, uh, that scholar, what's his name, uh, who wrote a book about Jesus and uh, uh, a, a very, uh, how can you say, a reputable scholar. Uh, he, is, he is of Middle Eastern descent, do you know? Like he came on CNN and everything and he wrote a book about Jesus, oh, just a yeah. historian. Reza and it was, Aslan. sorry? Reza Aslan. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So I don't know the person, uh, forgive me, but... I remember just seeing all these clips in the United States on, 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 on mainstream media. Like, how is it possible that a Muslim, I don't know, is he Muslim, but at least the Middle Eastern rights, well, is he Muslim? If I recall correctly, I think um, his family is Muslim, but I think he actually converted to Christianity, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay, well, I'm not really it, sure about that. just, but just I remember in his own, in his personal story, there was, um, there, there, there was a very interesting sort of religious story for himself. Okay. Well, I, I, anyway, there was this. Oh, I mean, semi. His name, the way his name Reza, that's a Muslim name. So that's right, right. And there was this outrage in the U.S. mainstream media. How can somebody like that write an objective book about Christianity? And then I thought again, you know, this, this total. Uh, how can I say lack of understanding of your own history? What have you been? What have you been doing for hundreds of years with anthropology and biology and any? I mean, it's and and and, and, and writing of, about Jesus because Jesus sorry? is not European, and, yeah. and writing about Jesus like Jesus is not European. So definitely, exactly by that by that standard. I mean, if anything, um, Reza Aslan probably has more of a more of a connection to the history of Jesus, oh, Jesus. Christ, yeah. geography in which he existed, <laughs> than. Europeans writing about right, it. right, right. Yeah, and that's the sense of entitlement that you see all over the West. I mean, if you would live in my country, it's the same. It's completely the same. It's like hundreds of years of of control over the world's narrative and and what can and what cannot. It makes it very, very hard to understand that other people can do the same things that you do uh, as well. So and and they have historically, right? Like and they have. <laughs> The pendulum swings. I mean, one of the interesting things about looking at the U.S. and its sort of like power is, you know, even if I mean, the U.S. has really only been a world power since the, after World War II, right? That's about 70 years. We're not even looking at the entirety of its history. But even if you look at the entirety of its history, the Ottoman Empire was around for about 600 years. So we've got a long few centuries to go. <coughs> yeah. Hopefully not, but, uh... but but on the other hand, we could also say the Western European Empire is now approximately five hundred years. So it's 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 similar to to the to the rest of the world history. Yeah? If you think about the Ottoman Turks or you think about the, the Egyptians, uh, around five six hundred years, you know, you would see that these 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 big uh, uh, empires uh, are the center of the world, so to speak. And I think Western Europe, you could say, of course, I'm lumping a lot of different countries together, but let's say Western Europe with regards to colonialism, uh, imperialism, that's kind of Western European style expansionist culture and, and white supremacy, of course. That is something that has been going on now for approximately 500 years. So I think we are experiencing, we are right in the middle of the change, I think. You know what I mean? I think it would be have been better to be born even later. I think that's more fun. 
But on the other hand, be happy that we were not born 200, 250 years ago. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. That's a nice optimistic note uh, to end on. That, that's <laughs> one of the few uh, optimistic notes we've hit this whole time. Yeah. I, I yeah. tried to be optimistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you were. I yeah, definitely. Mean... Yeah, that, that's very good. Sometimes I, I need, Peter and I actually need to learn that because the, this world is making me very, very pessimistic. Definitely. It can very easily do that. And I probably sound a lot more like a pessimist in other situations, but in this one case, you guys were really bringing me down. So I had to. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It's, we, we have to watch out for that with, with, with our next guest, uh, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> well, you put a little bit of California sunshine into, uh, into our discussion here. So, so thank you. Very much. All the sunlight I get. Yeah. Well, yeah, this was great. This was a great conversation, longer than I expected. Uh, super, super uh, that you came on. And, uh, I mean, yeah, I feel like we could keep going, by the way. Oh, yeah, like, definitely. I hope I keep going for, but Peter, uh, Peter and I have literally done this for hours at a time. So this is, yeah. this is just scratching the surface of how far yeah, we can go. It's been way too long. Uh, yeah, I, I really hope that, that travel can open up.